Elizabeth Lane Ferdell, who comes to us from the University of North Florida, where she is professor of history. She earned her PhD in history from Kent State University. She has a long list of scholarly achievements that if I began to enumerate, we'd be here for more than an hour. Her most recent book is titled Fatal Thirst and is a history of diabetes in Britain prior to insulin. Her edited collection of essays on medieval and early modern medicine, along with her books on publishing in medicine in early modern England and the royal doctors, medical personnel at the Tudor and Stuart courts, to name just a few, make her well qualified to hold forth on today's topic. She is the author of published essays too numerous to mention, some holding intriguing titles like The Notorious Astrologer Physician of London. So it seems clear to me that Dr. Ferdale arrives having done her homework for this afternoon's <coughs> lecture. The University of North uh, Florida's Distinguished Professor for 2002 and recipient of that institution's Outstanding Scholarship Award in 2006 Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ferdell as she tells us about magic, alchemy, and medicine in Harry Potter's world. Thank you. There are still some chairs if you'd like to come up a bit closer. Thanks, Mike, for that nice introduction, and uh, to those of you uh, here at UAB for inviting me to come along. It's given me an opportunity to Google your great collection, and uh, I hope that you'll all join me after the talk in uh, admiring all of the things that actually uh, are here all the time at uh, the UAB Library. I'm speaking to you this afternoon about magic, alchemy, and medicine in the English Renaissance to give you some idea about the historical context for the Harry Potter series. Um, my children have long thought that what I do is a bit strange. But once I told them that I was going to incorporate Harry Potter into it, suddenly I had new cachet. <laughs> and my daughter-in-law gave me some tips on Harry Potter himself. So uh, let's plunge ahead. J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter series of books and films has stimulated much interest in magic and wizardry. Here is a case of well-researched art imitating life, for the inspiration for the curriculum at the Hogwarts School can be found in the English Renaissance, in its alchemy, and in its medicine. Charms, spells, potions, and prophecies form just part of an age of proto-science, when credentialed and uncredentialed physicians alike searched for the Philosopher's Stone and prescribed remedies composed of such fancifuls as unicorn blood and mandrake root. The self-described Elizabethan sorcerer Simon Foreman dispensed pills and cast horoscopes <coughs> from his Suffolk residence, while respected chemists like Robert Boyle relied on distillation to find the numinous properties of material. Likewise, England's monarchs combined magic and medicine when they touched victims of the king's evil, a form of lymphatic tuberculosis. Indeed, proof of one's legitimacy as a divinely ordained head of state depended on the ceremony, which is why Charles Stuart in exile touched thousands of scrofulous sufferers before his restoration in 1660. For those more fastidious sovereigns who might fear contact with the oozing <coughs> sores of the sick, Gold coins called touch pieces or angels could be blessed by the ruler and distributed without recourse to actual touching. Both Mary I and Elizabeth I used such angels. Valentine Great Rakes, sometimes called the Irish Stroker, who was an avowed anti monarchist, enjoyed the patronage of the English elite after the Stuart Restoration. He treated the headaches of Anne. Viscountess Conway, and ministered to some of the leading intellectuals of the day, such as Robert Boyle, well, champion great race. Sir Edmund Barry Godfrey, Justice of the Peace for Westminster, called him the most prominent occult healer of the century. Great Rakes claimed to be able to cure the king's evil 
by divine intercession, and scores of sick Londoners besieged his lodgings there. Unfortunately for great rakes, he failed to prove his prowess in a demonstration before Charles II and the royal physicians, cementing the king's claim that only God's anointed sovereigns could heal. One royal apothecary who doubled as Charles' professor of chemics, Nicholas Lefebvre, suggested another remedy for scrofula, the application of human afterbirth and oil of grim. I think I'd rather have the king touch me. <laughs> as late as the 19th century in rural western England, toad doctors, practitioners of traditional medical folk magic, claimed to be able to heal scrofula although they also insisted they could cure other ailments, including those resulting from witchcraft. All you need do is tie a muslin bag containing a live toad or the leg of a dead one around a sick person's neck and wellness will fall. Even monarchs, however, feared evil beyond their control. James VI of Scotland, later James I of England, wrote a treatise on demonology while he ruled the Northern Kingdom, in large part because he felt beleaguered by malevolent forces. He believed warlocks had cursed his travels abroad, and that a cousin of his, Francis Stuart, the wizard Earl Bothwell, bedeviled him, even in the royal bedchamber at Holyrood House. Indeed, the wholesale persecution of witches started in Scotland while James was king, Witchcraft had been considered a crime before 1590, but little prosecution took place until a series of treason trials connecting 300 witches with plots to murder the king. Evidence included efforts to burn wax effigies of James and the performance of bizarre rituals in a church in Berwick. The persecution of accused witches continued in Scotland even after James took the crown of England in 1603. From his accession in the Southern Kingdom until 1625, nearly 450 witchcraft trials took place in Scotland, half resulting in the execution of those charged with demonic behavior. But when Parliament in England enacted a new witchcraft law in 1604, the English never really accepted theories of demonology and the government did not enforce the act during James's reign. However, the King James Version of the Bible included a famous translation in Exodus 22, 18. Quote, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Another Jacobean era wizard earl, Henry Percy, Earl of Northumberland, acquired his sobriquet from his passion for scientific and alchemical experiments. He had little else to do, imprisoned in the Tower of London for 17 years. There he made contact with Robert and Francis Carr, <coughs> Earl and Countess of Somerset, inmates for conspiring to kill a man with poison. Percy was also lifelong friends with the great Magus John Dee, and their intellectual circles overlapped. During the stress of the English Civil War in the 1640s, Matthew Hopkins served as Parliament's unofficial witch finder general. Inspired by demonology and a chance to make money, Hopkins targeted purported witches stained with the devil's mark and whose pets were their familiars. Following trials at which Hopkins' evidence dominated the court, between 200 and 400 convicted witches died by hanging. Two generations later, Isaac Newton, arguably the epitome of rational science, <clears throat> pursued alchemy with a passion equal to that of his colleagues, colleagues in the 18th century Royal Society. After purchasing and studying Newton's alchemical works in 1942, the economist John Maynard Keynes opined the quote, Newton was not the first of the age of reason. He was the last of the magicians. <laughs> None of this should surprise anyone familiar with British myths and legends, for a culture that includes in its essence sarsen stones, druids, 
Avalon, Merlin the Conjurer, and Hill Forts could easily produce a ministry of magic. To this day, belief persists in ley lines, a network of energy meridians all over Britain and Ireland. Let us further examine the mix of magic in medicine that dominated the British Isles well past the scientific revolution and into the world of Harry Potter. The roots of the twin pursuits of magic and medicine go deep into the British past. Anglo-Saxon healers relied on leech books, compilations of medical remedies, mostly herbal in nature. The oldest surviving text, the Leech Book of Gaul, dates to the 9th century, likely a product of Alfred the Great's educational reforms. It gives recipes using vervain, mugwort, plantain, periwinkle, wood betony, violets, yarrow, and many other herbs still in medical use today. Anglo-Saxon medical practice sought to heal both body and spirit. Therefore, a great deal of the book concerns itself with charms and amulets to protect against evil influences. Even straightforward medical problems, like a slice from a plow blade, combined practical and magical treatments. Wounds should be sung into to promote healing, and the wounded would be ordered to perform certain mystical rites, like walking in a moonlit field as part of the cure. The Leech Book of Gaul, still relatively free from Mediterranean medical influences, recommends binding a stalk of cross, crosswort to the head with a red kerchief as a simple cure for headache, <laughs> while curing sh shingles required a complex potion using the bark of 15 different trees. Poems called Charms, written in the 10th and 11th centuries, invoked herbal cures for various dilemmas, like unfruitful land, loss of cattle, and delayed birth. Others promised protection from dwarves, water elf disease, and warts. Any injured sufferer might be helped by the nine <coughs> herbs charm, the potpourri of mugwort, plantain, lamb's cress, hotspur grass, chamomile, that's a familiar one, nettle, crab apple, chervil, and fennel, all pounded into a powder, mixed with soap and apple juice, and applied as a salve on the injury, as the poem itself is sung into the mouth, ears, and wound of the patient. Early medicine was an equal opportunity employer, open to both genders, as is Hogwarts. Cunning men and women, practitioners of folk magic, provided healing services across the British Isles. Sometimes known as wise men, wizards, or conjurers, they also claimed the ability to expel evil spirits. Their magic was good magic, white magic, such as associated with Harry Potter's mentor, Albus, meaning white, Dumbledore. Though even the humblest of people had rudimentary knowledge of herbs for first aid and seasonal tonics, many of the most skilled healers were monks and nuns who benefited from the handing down of leech books within their learned communities. They would have been among the first to be exposed to the recovered teachings of the Roman physician Galen, or physician to Marcus Aurelius. Galen's theories of medicine preserved by Byzantines and Arabs, formed a coherent whole that explains sickness and health based on four humors in the human body. These humors, blood, phlegm, yellow, and black bile, had to be kept in balance for wellness to be maintained. Hence, the efforts to restore equilibrium included bleedings, purgatives, and vomitories. I hope you haven't had a snack before. <laughs> the relative levels of these humors also decided the heat and coldness, dryness or moisture of a person's constitution. The dominant humor shaped temperament, producing sanguine, phlegmatic, melancholic, or choleric personalities. 
Galenic physicians focused on an individual's constitution and prescribed highly idiosyncratic compound remedies for their patients within a universal framework. But adherence to Galenism did not prohibit medical men from looking beyond convention <coughs> to find the hidden mysteries of the universe. Alchemists had two principal goals. First, they wanted to find the way to transmute common metals into gold. And second, they hoped to find or create the elixir of life, a remedy that would cure all diseases and prolong life indefinitely. Among the earliest of English alchemists was Hugh of Evesham, an English churchman nicknamed the Black Cardinal. He studied at Oxford and abroad before beginning his career around 1270 as a royal clerk under Edward I. His prowess as a medical man eventually led to his becoming physician to Pope Martin IV in Rome, where he was charged with ending an epidemic then current in the city. During his tenure there, Hugh composed a number of writings on alchemy and medicine, uniting magic and science. John Creamer, the pseudonym for an eminent scholar and abbot of Westminster during the reign of Edward III, studied hermetic philosophy and searched for practical knowledge in alchemy. He met the Majorcan Dr. Illuminatus, Raymond Lully, while traveling to Italy and brought him back to England where Lully disclosed to him the secrets of the stone. Although alchemy had a long history, dating back to the Hermetica of late antiquity. Its practice enjoyed a renaissance of its own with the rediscovery of historic texts and their transmission to Western Europe. Later Italian scholars, especially Marsilio Piccino, compiled a Latin collection of manuscripts that went through eight incunable editions before 1500 and a further 22 by 1641. Among the most important texts to alchemists was the cryptic Emerald Tablet, purporting to be inspired by the Greek god Hermes and the Egyptian god Thoth. Like medicine itself, intellectual pursuits in the Renaissance blended the rational with superstition. Many of the earliest masterminds demonstrated that knowledge could not be compartmentalized into the practical and impractical. 13th century Franciscan friar Roger Bacon has often been labeled the first true scientist, discoverer of the scientific method, but he worked extensively with alchemy and wrote on the occult. Bacon's contemporary George Ripley, canon of Bridlington, studied in Italy, where he became a favorite of Pope Innocent VIII, then returned to England to publish The Compound of Alchemy, or 12 gates leading to the discovery of the Philosopher's Stone. He dedicated the work to King Edward IV and gained fame for claiming that he could turn base metals into gold. Alchemy gained even greater respectability in the 16th century with the propagation of chemical medicine associated with the Swiss doctor and religious zealot Paracelsus, a.k.a. Theophrastus, Bombastus, von Hohenheim. No wonder he liked his pen name better. Just as Martin Luther attacked the spiritual authority of the Roman Catholic Church and endangered its <coughs> financial supremacy, Paracelsus challenged the authority of learned Galenist physicians and threatened their position at the top of the medical hierarchy throughout Europe. Believing that disease came from outside the human body, he repudiated humoral diagnoses with their reliance on herbal concoctions. And instead, he posited that cures might be found through intense laboratory experimentation with chemicals and minerals, especially the trio of salt, sulfur, and mercury. Paracelsus found Galenism ludicrous and corrupt in its insistence that each sufferer was unique 
and could only be healed through the application of unique composite remedies. Instead, he sought to find specific cures for specific diseases common to all men. His chemical medicine also differed from Galenism and its doctrine of curing through opposites. Paracelsus posited that like cures like and experimented with poisons similar to the toxins in the sick person's body. No wonder that the Hogwarts school contains a statue to this medical maverick. Any litany of English alchemists must include the influential Elizabethan Magus John Dee, a follower of Paracelsus and devotee of chemical medicine. At his house at Mortlake, near London, he owned the kingdom's largest library, perhaps 4,000 items, at least a fourth of which were books, and all of which were available to other scholars and to ambitious courtiers. Living in a world that was half magical, half scientific, Dee had a passionate interest in hermeticism and claimed to have acquired a manuscript from a deceased bishop, along with some mysterious <coughs> power, that enabled him to make gold, one of the three magisteriums alchemists sought to achieve. The other two magisteriums were the means to heal physical illnesses through the same agent that produced transmutation and the ability to attain unity with the divine spirit. Dee declared that he had found the elixir of life at Glastonbury Abbey. Since he believed that God channeled his powers through the stars, as a philosopher magician like Paracelsus, Dee hoped to use knowledge of astrology to benefit mankind in general and England in particular. He surely influenced his contemporaries, developing sought-after opinions in mathematics, astronomy, and navigation, the latter of which <coughs> promoted English imperialism. But Dee straddled the worlds of magic and science, trying to commune with angels, casting horoscopes for the aristocracy, and even pinpointing, by studying the stars, the best date for Queen Elizabeth's coronation. D can be seen as a precursor of Dr. Robert Flood, another English Paracelsian who blended tradition with change. After receiving his arts degree at Oxford by 1598, Flood developed his medical philosophy during a six-year sojourn on the continent. Upon his return to England, he obtained medical degrees at Oxford in 1605. Despite his supposed medical modernity, Flood subscribed to the long-established theory of geocentricity, and he corresponded with Johannes Kepler, a proponent of heliocentricity, debating the scientific versus hermetic approaches to knowledge. And they both had much in common with Robert Boyle, prominent alchemist scientist whose mid-Stuart laboratory in London was legendary. Boyle believed strongly in transmutation. He was even able to influence the government to repeal a statute against multiplying gold and silver. Thought he had found the way to do it. Well, in England, the rancor between Galenists and Paracelsians threatened the supremacy of the university-educated doctors and the unity of the Royal College of Physicians. Theodore Mayern, renowned French medical man residing at the court of James I, managed to forge a compromise between the warring factions, agreement reflected in the diversity of recipes found in the London Pharmacopoeia, published under the imprimatur of the college in 1618. But whatever cooperation between the theoretical antagonists that had been affected by Mayern collapsed in the 1630s when incendiary politics confounded opposing medical theories. College fellows oversaw the licensing of doctors throughout England and branded anyone without its authorization a quack. 
Meanwhile, critics of the learned physicians argued that their knowledge of medicine derived exclusively from books, that they had little or no compassion for their patients, sometimes even using intermediaries to observe symptoms and process urine flasks, and that they charged too much for their services. When plague raged in London in the 1620s, most of these elite medicos vacated the city for safer residents in the countryside, leaving the care of the sick and dying to irregular healers, those quacks. During the English Civil War, some challengers vowed to reform medicine by licensing surgeons and apothecaries to treat patients directly, while others envisioned new schools that emphasized clinical experience over contemplation. Nicholas Culpepper, produced multiple books with advice to ordinary men and women on how they might treat themselves and their families when ill. His herbals, illustrated to assist in the gathering of English vegetables, best for Englishmen, relied on traditional folk medicine for its recipes. Later on in the same century, John Archer published a book called Every Man His Own Physician. And that was certainly the direction that the challengers to the elite doctors uh, were managing to create. Publishing also brought to the fore a large number of astrological almanacs, perhaps understandable given the twin troubles, pestilence and war, visited on Britain during the 16th and 17th centuries. Although astrology became marginalized by the elite, considering its long association with magic, one might expect to find stargazing on the syllabus at Hogwarts. Professor Sybil Trelawney, using a magical astrolabe to illustrate the fascinating angle Mars was making with Neptune, tries to teach her reluctant pupils that astrology can reveal signs of danger and predict other natural events. Linked to Galenism, astrological physics filled early modern almanacs, advising readers on how the movements of the stars and planets over the coming year would affect the reader's health. At its simplest level, an almanac might only contain a, desire, <coughs> a, a diagram of zodiac man, this character on the left, a figure that dates all the way back to the 13th century which shows the relationship between the signs of the zodiac and parts of the human body. So depending upon when you were born or what month it currently was, you could be treated appropriately. And you'll notice uh, there's a ram, a sheep on the top of zodiac man's head, that's Aries, fish, or Pisces, or his feet. Best place to treat during those months. A lot of the other almanacs included sections on basic astrological guidelines on the most auspicious times for preventive or remedial medicine. In uh, Pepys Diary, uh, written in the 1660s, he talks about going regular, regularly to his surgeon to be bled so that he wouldn't pop like a cork. That's part of the standard uh, repertoire. Reflective of Galen's humoral theories, the number four figured prominently in astrology, with the universe divided into four basic elements, fire, water, earth, and air. The bodies of all living creatures mirrored these characteristics, as well as their life cycles, beginning with a warm and moist childhood and moving in a cold and dry old age. Each of the four seasons of the year linked to this pattern and to specific signs of the zodiac, which gave them their characteristic features. Fascinated by all forms of natural science and material theory, Isaac Newton became obsessed with the Emerald Tablet, or the secret of Hermes, part of his overall captivation with occult studies. He translated the short text into English, while warning fellow Hermeticist Robert Boyle to keep high silence and not to discuss alchemy in public. 
Newton joined the secret Rosicrucian Society, feeling that he, like other enlightened members, could communicate with angels or spirits, and that they shared a belief in alchemy and the ancient past. Deeply religious, Newton's experiments with light likely derived from his interpretation of the Emerald Tablet that light embodied the word of God. By Newton's day, the government banned some alchemical inquiry and dictated severe penalties, ostensibly to protect wealthy benefactors from being swindled by unscrupulous practitioners, but in reality, to avoid the potential devaluation of gold should the Philosopher's Stone actually be discovered. Newton likely left his alchemical work unpublished because he feared punishment. But in 1936, Sotheby's auctioned a collection of his papers, over a third of which were alchemical in nature, including a lengthy treatise on the Philosopher's Stone. Newton brought together the worlds of science, magic, and mystery personifying the continuities and changes of the age in which he lived. Many of the elements we associate with historical magic, medicine, and alchemy can be found in Harry Potter. The folklore of the British Isles is filled with tales of shape-shifting fairies, such as the benevolent Celtic Puka or the homicidal Kelpie. Stay away from that Kelpie. <laughs> Folklore also refers to invisibility cloaks, like the one in the Half-Blood Prince, made from the hair of the ape-like Asian demigods, in which to hide in plain sight. Not only do werewolves shift in Harry Potter, an animagus, like Sirius Black, can turn into an animal, in his case, a dog, Sirius, the dog star. Harry's teacher of the dark arts, Remus Lupin, demonstrates how to conjure positive feelings in order to protect oneself. He also shows his pupil the usefulness of disarming charms, one producing a jet of scarlet light, <laughs> and another, a spurt of water. Inanimate objects, like enchanted wands and sorting hats, possess startling abilities to choose their own wizards. Quilled pens can assist or block cheating, provide quick quotes and spell check functions, or cut up the hands of your enemies. Mysterious mirrors reflect the images that you want to see. I think I'd like to pick them. <laughs> Stairs morph in response to the powers of the exceptionally gifted. In the Sorcerer's Stone, dragons, werewolves, and unicorns contend with Harry and his friends, though none of those creatures can match Harry's nemesis, Lord Voldemort, for cunning and trickery. The Sorcerer's Stone they search for, as did John Dee, can make you immortal. Potions abound in the Chamber of Secrets, the Goblet of Fire, and the Half-Blood Prince. Professor Severus Snape advises his pupils to take great care in the laboratory, given the volatility of their bruise composition. Real-life alchemist and mystic Thomas Vaughan died in 1666 from the fumes of the mercury he thought might be the universal solvent. Some potions brought benefits like the regrowing of broken bones, or the bestowing of good luck, Felix Felicis, while others could turn animals into water goblets, age whoever consumes the brew, or change you into a Slytherin, member of the Hogwarts house most, most associated with Lord Voldemort and his followers. But my favorite is the so-called polyjuice potion in Harry Potter enabling one person to become another person for an hour anyway. And it was filled with ingredients many Renaissance era magi would have had on the shelf. Fluxwood, a mustard family herb used for dysentery. Knotgrass, a form of buckwheat. Leeches, 
in vogue even today for bleeding and wound cleaning. Bicorn horn taken from a mythological monster and the skin of a boom slaying snake whose venom prevents clotting. Hogwarts potion master, Horace Slughorn, could tamper with human memory, even his own, and revealed that by creating a horcrux that is magically hiding a piece of one's soul, one might live on forever. Amulets provided protection against evil forces. Again, Rowling's art imitates life. The Roman Catholic Church set apart certain material objects called sacramentals to excite good thoughts and increase devotion. Holy water, the crucifix, and the St. Benedict medal were recommended as protectors against evil. Herbs had valuable properties for the wizards in training, such as the gilly flower to help you breathe underwater. Harry himself can talk to snakes, a quality the Slytherins possess. In the Prisoner of Azkaban, the school employs several teachers whose specialty is defense against the dark arts, and another who teaches divination. Harry's friend Hermione learns to turn back time to save his godfather, Sirius Black, from execution. Harry ascertains from Sirius in the Order of the Phoenix that wizards like him have both dark and light in their souls. Historical wizards, however, were not always able to protect themselves from the jealous and the powerful. Alexander Seton, a 17th century Scottish adept, found that the hospitality afforded him by Christian II, the young elector of Saxony, sprang only from the desire to learn the secrets of transmutation. When Seton refused to disclose the mysteries of alchemy, Christian ordered him in prison and tortured until he divulged his knowledge. The man who ultimately rescued Seton, Michael Sandivogis, received a powder from the shattered Scot on his deathbed, but frittered it away and degenerated himself into a charlatan. Friends and enemies alike lusted for the strength they felt wizards possessed. No wonder that in order to foster international cooperation among others with magical powers, Hogwarts hosts a tri-wizard tournament where Harry selflessly saves the life of a competitor's sister. Harry's model in wizardry is the kind, kindly Professor Dumbledore, who rescues our hero on numerous occasions. Wizards can know the past. And Harry's dreams reveal to him things that happened before he was born, so that he can make sense of why the evil Voldemort is his nemesis, and why Hogwarts students must remain alert to his threats. When the High Commissioner, Dolores Umbridge, <laughs> changes the curriculum and denies the need for defensive magic, Harry and his friends practice their safeguards in secret. Prophecy also figures prominently in the series of books. Pupils at Hogwarts learn that divination retains a formal or ritual character, such as taught to them by Pro Professor Forensic, a centaur hired after Sybil Trelawney was sacked. While fortune telling, on the other hand, is just an everyday practice for personal purposes. So many ways exist to tell fortunes. There's astromancy by the stars, hydromancy by water, oniromancy by dreams, and crystallomancy by crystal ball. The newspaper in Harry Potter is the aptly named Daily Prophet. It seems a lot like modern tabloids with its wild prognostications. But at the prophecy ball at the Department of Magic, Harry hears the prediction that his ongoing struggle with Voldemort, who has the power of mind control, must end in the death of one of them killed by the other. Predictions have long occupied the minds of England's factual inhabitants. For instance, the Druids used quartz stones in their divination. John Dee, friends with an Italian mathematician who cast a horoscope of Jesus, 
employed crystal balls to tell fortunes, and called on Scryer Edward Kelly when contacting angels. Scryer was a kind of intermediary. <clears throat> ben Johnson made Merlin the Magician, legendary wizard of the Arthurian saga, spokesman, spokesman for Stuart England's future in a 1610 mass dedicated to Prince Henry. The alleged accuracy of hand-painted tarot cards for the elite led to the printing of the first fortune-telling cards in England in 1690. In sum, I hope I've convinced you that the Harry Potter series of novels reflects most of the standard beliefs and practices about the talents of those special people who dabbled in magic, alchemy, and medicine during the English Renaissance. Thank you for your attention.